Think of our poor sister world, Venus, almost exactly the same size as Earth, probably had oceans at the beginning. Venus was closer in to the Sun and was never in the continuously habitable Goldilocks zone. Instead, our poor cousin Venus quickly got a greenhouse effect that erased its oceans, drove all the water away. And what we have is a desert world. And that's what will happen to Earth. If we either fill the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, or if we just wait a hundred million years as the Goldilocks zone inner edge moves past where our planet orbits. Let's lift the Earth. Raise it up. The whole planet. Well, there are ways to do that, and there are reasons to do it. After all, anybody who ever saw Woody Allen's movie Radio Days knows that we were promised five billion more years of having a habitable Earth. And it turns out that's not true. Woody lied to us. It turns out that it's five billion years until the Sun, a G-type star, expands prodigiously and eats the Earth. But a long time before that, the Sun's gradual increase in temperature is going to make our planet uninhabitable. Perhaps as soon as 100 million years from now, which is about the same time scale as it took for mammals to evolve into us after the asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Earth might have only one more chance if we blow it. Earth skates the very inner edge of the so-called Goldilocks zone around our sun, the continuously habitable zone. And this is the reason why only a little bit of carbon dioxide generated by human industry in our atmosphere is causing so much problems. Because we need an atmosphere that's almost completely transparent in order to lose heat fast enough. The Gaia balance, and you can look that up, adjusts the amount of greenhouse gas so that the seas stay liquid. And if the Earth had been where Mars is, if Mars had been larger, we would have a sister world out there with oceans, but just a very, very dense CO2 atmosphere because that's where its Gaia balance would have reached. We have no such room. We have no wiggle room. We skate the very inner edge of our sun's continuously habitable or Goldilocks zone. And that inner edge is creeping outward slowly. Don't confuse this with human-generated climate change. This is much slower, but it's too fast for comfort. In a hundred million years, the deserts will spread and the oceans will start to go away. We got to get out of here. Well, the typical thing we're told is, you can't move the Earth, so flee. And indeed, as Elon Musk wants to do, and so many others have talked about, we should create other habitable realms for humanity, both in the solar system, Europa, Mars, asteroid colonies, but also maybe interstellar. Why not? Let's do it. But I have some emotional attachment to this planet. I'd like it to live longer. If we're so brainy, can't we do something for our Earth? Notice I just plugged the title of one of my novels, Earth. Well, how could we do it? One method that is discussed a lot is if we were to get out in the solar system, become great masters of the solar system, we could steer asteroids, and those asteroids would swing right past the Earth in near misses and transfer some of their forward momentum with each pass to the Earth and gradually pump its orbit up. I think that's one of the stupidest ideas ever imagined. Sure, it might work if you were to fly past 10 million times. And in those 10 million near brushes, 
What godlike level of competence would you require in order for none of them, to know for sure that none of them would ever veer a little bit and strike the planet? <laughs> Seems a bad idea. Another possibility is called the gravitational tug, and this is how we might move asteroids that are heading toward the Earth, shift them out of the way. It's the only way we know to do it now, and that is to take a spacecraft, a heavy spacecraft, with an ion engine, and sort of hover it near the asteroid and pump away with the ion engines just enough so that the asteroid's gravity is not broken away from. And in that case, the asteroid sort of follows the spacecraft. And we could set up an asteroid, maybe at the L1 or L2 or L5 points of Earth's orbit, and tug the Earth away. Now, there's a problem with these ideas, another problem. And that is, it's going to take millions of years to lift something as heavy as the Earth with little nudges, generations, eons, the lifespan of whole civilizations, perhaps the lifespan of species. Moreover, your method is going to have to survive rises and falls of these cultures, of these civilizations, periods of time when a society decides we're not going to invest in this, we're going to think short term. We don't have the money right now, we're passing through a depression. Uh, perhaps civilization falls and they have to recover and read the old records and re-realize the imperative that they owe their planet. Whatever method you come up with is going to have to survive disruptions, pauses, even changes of government or species. Is there a way? Now I want to tell you a little bit, pause and do a little aside here about electrodynamic tethers. Now, electrodynamic tethers are really cool. I talk about them in my novel, Existence, and in a uh, short story called Tank Farm Dynamo that you can download from my website, davidbrin.com. Basically, as the great world expert on tethers, Joe Carroll, has indicated, if you allow a conducting cable to settle into gravity around the Earth as it's orbiting around the Earth, it will stabilize along a radius from the center of the Earth. And it, this is called gravity gradient stabilization. But let's say it's made of a conducting material. Well, this orbit is cutting through the Earth's magnetic field. So an EMF, or electromotive force, or voltage, becomes induced, just like the armature of a generator, along the length of this tether. Well, if you were to spew electrons off one end with a cathode, you would then be able to suck energy out of the orbit. The tether would slowly go down, but you'd get all the power you need for your space station. And I talk about this in Tank Farm Dynamo. But if you were to have a lot of power, a nuclear power plant or solar cells or something, and push the electrons against the EMF, so that they spew out the other end, a funny thing happens. You're no longer having an armature of a dynamo. You have the armature of a motor, and you're cranking against the Earth's magnetic field, and the electromagnetic tether rises. Ain't it cool? And we're about to do these things. The experiments have been done. Joe Carroll's done them with the Air Force. We're about to start using this method to go around low Earth orbit without expending any rocket fuel at all, just energy. All right, so we have this guy here. Is there any way we could use this? Hmm. Well, you can see that this is a relative of the space elevator. The space elevator concept is a tether that's anchored to the Earth at the equator and has a counterweight beyond geosynchronous orbit and a big space station here at GEO. These are different scales. Well, the space elevator is a concept people are talking about now. The new carbon fibers, maybe we can build it. Maybe better up around Mars, where Kim Stanley Robinson portrays it being done uh, in his great novel, Red Mars. Combine these things. Now you have a space elevator 
with, that's conducting, cutting through the Earth's magnetic field, uh, uh, it can be caused to tug on the Earth and maybe tug it upward. Uh, there's a problem because the Earth is rotating so fast, 24-hour day, it's going to be very difficult to time the pumps in just the right way so that the effect is not on Earth's rotation, but on its orbit. We have to add momentum to Earth's orbit so that it rises, so that it gets farther from the Sun. There is another approach. And it's a combo of this. I was brainstorming with a young fellow online, and I can't remember his name, but we came up with this notion. And that is, you cannot count on generation after generation maintaining a space elevator on the Earth. And if it falls, it's going to do some damage. But here is an object called the moon. And the moon, you could put a space elevator on the other side of the moon. And if it falls, eh, not a lot of damage, not a lot of harm. If it breaks, the space elevator just floats away into space. If this space elevator were also conducting, it would be taking commerce in, resources from the asteroids, it would be sending out refined or uh, developed materials. It would be part of a whole industry there. People would be counting on the space elevator and they wouldn't be thinking about what's going on in the background, and that is that you have a conducting cable here and it's cutting through the sun's magnetic field. And this one, it takes a month for the orbit. It's easy to time the pumping of the electrons so that there's a, a constant pumping action, rhythmic pumping action, that's tugging on the moon. And as it tugs on the moon, the moon tries to rise, but the Earth resists. The Earth resists, and the Earth follows. And this is how you do it. Without endangering the Earth with those stupid asteroid flybys, you pump it with a conducting space elevator on the far side of the moon. And the great advantage is civilizations can rise and fall. Budgets can be cut. The tether can be cut. It just flows away. You replace it. Over the course of millions of years, all you need is for the rich phases of the rich civilizations to do this half the time. And over the course of millions of years, move the planet as the sun's heat moves the continuously habitable zone or Goldilocks zone further outward. So then the question is, the question is, could this solve our problems now with global climate change? There's a branch of science called geoengineering, and too many people are opposed to even thinking about it. It's wrong to not think about it, to not do simple experiments. Yes, our number one job is to prevent the thing that we're doing that's harming the Earth. And far more stupid are the people who are ignoring global climate change, denying it exists, or even if they're skeptical that humans are causing climate change, refusing to negotiate twoda, things we ought to be doing anyway, that would help us to become more efficient, save a lot of money, while investing in a precaution just in case the smart people the 99% of scientists might turn out to be right. Oh, there's no question that that's the biggest stupidity. But there's stupidity among those who won't even talk about the option of finding a possible win-win bit of engineering that could help us save the planet. Maybe stirring bottom muck in the oceans could cause so much plankton that we get new fisheries, like exactly what happens off the Grand Banks or in Chile. And that would suck carbon out of the air. Maybe. 
But you can see where I'm going with this. Should we be thinking about moving the Earth a little farther away from the Sun? I think that's a little too ambitious for now. But it's not too soon to be thinking in science fictional terms about the ambitions that are rich and fantastically capable and powerful descendants. I'm talking to you, descendants, right now. Might decide to do to save this world that's been very good to them. Lift the earth.